I, li I like all the rules um, for being a speaker here. It says, please inform the speaker to stay within the pink box, although I've been told I have a pass on this one. No, I'm not going to do it. I, I can't stand in the box because the laptop's over here and the box is over there. You can see the problem. And so they, they move the camera. So if I go to the pink box, I'm actually upsetting the camera people. And I, so I can't do that. Uh, and I tend to do this while speaking. So that's probably breaking some rule. I understand there's a Tumblr about the rules of IETF. It also says that I'm not allowed to remove this clipboard from this room. And I wasn't going to, but now I want to. Uh, <laughs> so if y'all have any other like rules. And, and there's a little rule, we're just going to call them rule cards. There's a rule card that's that, hmm, yeah. Uh, so it's standard now. Um, so there's a rule card on this microphone over here that says you have to say your name before you ask a question. So unless you don't, you don't have to say your name and ask a question. You can just say your name. Because uh, <laughs> I've heard the questions, and I'm, I don't want to be challenged that much. Uh, again, one last to raise your hand. If you have a seat next to you, there's people standing up. Um, just See, there's lots of room if you all want to roll on in here. So. Um, I'm trying to say y'all since we're in Dallas. Um, it, it's actually a return to form because I, I lived in Virginia for a while. Um, OK, I think we can get started. Yeah? Is, this, is, this, is it time? I have a, I have a ridiculously high, dis high density display, so it's hard to see anything on it. Uh, and also, I have a privacy screen. So I have to do this. So if I'm doing this, it's not that my neck is sore, although it is. Um, but I, I don't want a massage. Um, OK, so hi. I'm uh, Chris DeBona. I work for Google, uh, have for some time. Um, uh, I'd like to think we all just basically uh, do things when Vint tells us to. Um, and uh, the last time I spoke at IETF uh, was IETF 73 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I don't know how many of you were there in Minnesota. You might remember mine as being the shortest host plenary in the history of the IETF. It was one minute and 47 seconds long. And, I th and some of you came up to me and said, listen, uh, the problem with your talk is we didn't have enough time to spin up the back channel to slag on you. So. Uh, in, in an effort to rectify that situation, this is, we have 45 minutes to abuse you, uh, to, to talk to you. And um, although we'll have some time at the end for questions if you'd like to do any of that. Um, so first I want to recap my plenary talk. If my computer is working, I assure you it is. Okay, so we're going to recap my IATF 73 talk, which I'll remind you uh, was one minute and 47 seconds long. Uh, I basically put up this image and I said, I am not Vince Cerf and thank you for existing. Um, when, I was, when I was putting together this thing, I was, I was trading a message with one of the organizers, um, or it might have been Denise, and I said, uh, I'm going to come to, oh, okay, I'll, I'll come to, I'll speak at IETF if they really want me to. And it, and it spell checked in Android, uh, IETF to surf. And I was like, really? I mean, that's got to be intentional, right? So I, I'm going to look into that. Um, but I thought I would lead with a picture of Vint because we all just like him so very much. And I did ask him how much he weighed. So. In case you were wondering, that's, that's how tall he is. He's six feet and one half of an inch, not six and a half feet. Um, so standards, again, would have been helpful here. Um, <laughs> okay. And what I said was, and, and what is still very, very true, is uh, why should Google care about the Internet Engineering Task Force, right? Um, Google really only exists because the Internet exists. I know, shocker. And, um, and, and the Internet really only exists because of IETF and groups not as important, but like it, um, you know, making things happen in a way that doesn't exclude people doing things on the internet. And, and I know this is all basic stuff, but it's a lunch talk, so I can, I don't have to be all cool like the last working group on telephone numbers. Um, <laughs> no, there, it wasn't just like how to call people or like a telephone book for the IETF. It was like something else. I, I, I came in late, so I think it was, I think it was about something else. It wasn't about a phone book. There was a lot of humming. So. Um, anyway, <laughs> so uh, the ITF is really important to Google, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, you know, we wouldn't exist without the internet. We wouldn't be able to crawl the internet if, if people didn't conform to certain standards. And we wouldn't be able to even fling packets around the way we're used to. So, um, oh, it's Ben. Hi, Ben. Uh, good to see you. Um, there's, there's some seats. There's a seat here and there and there. There's, there's like seats up here, folks, if you want to sit. See, this guy, he's been raising his hand every time I've asked. Like, he, he, he wants someone to sit next to him. <laughs> and I don't, I don't, like, and this guy, he doesn't smell. You know, I, he, I think you took a shower, right, in the last 24 hours, right? So, or not. And, but he doesn't smell, I assure you. I mean, I would smell. Or I have a very developed sense of smell. Jim. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, uh, but let's continue. So, um, 
obviously, I, I look after open source for Google. And what that means at Google, okay, let me be really clear about this, is that I don't control anything. No, no. It means that um, whenever code comes into the company and whenever code leaves the company, um, myself, my group, largely, largely, we're, we're a very large company, so mistakes happen, but largely, we make sure we, we don't screw that up, right? That, that the licenses are properly applied, that we conform and pay attention to open source licensing, and, and, and don't screw that up, because open source is super important to Google. We use a ton of it, we release a ton of it, and, and we see the open source community not as something separate from Google, but as you know, inherent in what we do. Uh, we, ha we, we employ a ton of people whose entire existence is either you know, working on, releasing, or being part of some open source software development community somewhere. Right? So, so we just want to make sure that we do that well and do it, and do it correctly. Um, so that's kind of my job. Now, in, in a company the size of Google, mistakes will be made, and other people will want to do things, and that's okay. And so we just try to make sure that we're there for them so that they know that they can do this sort of thing. Uh, there's a seat here and a seat here. There's two up here in the front row, gentlemen. Um, I also look after funny things that come up, like uh, API specifications, li licensing, and the rest, and, and making sure that they're released under fair terms whenever possible. Um, over there, there's, I love. All, I know you're not looking to talk to me. If you did, you would walk to the, the roll card microphone. So that's good. <coughs> we'll take questions. You, you, you can interrupt anytime you want, but whatever. Um, not that that would ever happen at IETF. Um, so, so when I thought about what talk I wanted to give here, I didn't want to just like rehash like, oh, here's all the stuff we've released and stuff. Uh, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to talk about something that's really been bugging me over the last, and it's really been happening more over the last two or three years than over the last 10 years. Um, and um, and, and th there's a huge interaction with the standards community in this too. Uh, open source has been extremely successful. I mean, I, I don't need to, to tell, tell, tell you folks this. Um, and, and so is the internet. Right? You've heard of the internet, right? So back in 1994 or 95, I was, I, was in a, uh, I was in an elevator and Netscape had just gone public. I was in an elevator in Washington, D.C. I was working for a law firm at the time, and they had a, a burgeoning and very successful intellectual property practice. And, and, and the lawyer, he looks at me, he's like, you're with the IT department, aren't you? I mean, we were such the IT department at this law firm. Let me be very clear what they did. Uh, for, for the IT department, the repro graphics department, the people who photocopy things, uh, and the accounting department, they took the bottom of the parking garage and threw an office space. Okay? So you would go to work, I would, I would go to the bottom of the parking lot, I would park my car, and I'd go down a level. Okay, and this is in Washington, D.C., so I'm literally like seven stories below the water table and probably some Cold War bunker they converted with pretty lighting and carbon monoxide detectors. Um, and it's probably the worst place for a data center, eight stories underground, but whatever. Um, so, so I was riding up the elevator to get some sunlight, and, um, and he says to me, you're one of those IT guys, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like... Um, and I was a kid, so I was probably like, yeah. Um, and he's like, well, you saw that Netscape went public. And I'm like, sure, of course, you know. And he goes, that's on the internet, right? And I'm like, yes. And he goes, well, you know, I have to tell you something. I'm really disappointed in TCP IP. I'm like, oh, well, why are you disappointed in TCP IP? I think it's a brilliant protocol. He goes, well, you know, if they had properly patented that, they could have charged for every packet. And I'm like, it's, it's one of those moments you're like, you know, you want to be respectful of your coworkers, no matter how stupid they are. And, and, and I said, well, you have to realize there are plenty of protocols out there that were happy to charge you a penny per packet or, or, or a tenth of a cent per packet, right? Um, we had our SNAs. We had, I, I said the OSI stack because I like making fun of it. Um, but like, you know, there are lots of things that people were happy to charge you with, uh, charge, you, <laughs> charge you with, charge you for. And, and, and they tried to sell these things, and people, some people adopted them, sure, and they would show up and play on some token ring somewhere. And, but TCP IP took off for the same reason the internet took off, right? You know, no one was basically rent-seeking, and it was a clever protocol, right, that would do what we wanted it to do, which was to internet connect computers, right? So, and that's obviously the simplification of why TCP IP is awesome, but it was just like one of those moments where I was like, I shouldn't work here at this law firm, you know? Like, what am I doing here? And, and of course, we also represented Satan. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, it was tobacco and oil. But um, not that, oh, it's funny, I don't have a beef against oil, but 
the tobacco and the anti-Superfund lawsuits, but we won't go there. Uh, long and short of it is that that law firm's not in business anymore, so I can trash them as much as I want. Um, they grew too fast, borrowed too much money, and tried to charge per packet, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> so, so the thing is, though, it, it really drove home, even back in the mid-'90s, it's like, um, you know, having these open solutions, these open standards, and I realized it really refined, and the word open source, we hadn't coined it yet or anything. Um, you know, I knew about the GPL and GNU and all that stuff, but, um, you know, just the word free was so powerful back then, and, and just, you could download, you could, you, could, you could serve up pages so easily, you didn't have to ask anyone's permission, you didn't have to go to a vendor, and in fact, if you went to a vendor, you would be just slow, right? You could, at the time, you would contact the, the Sun Microsystems of the day, and, and you would say, hey, uh, I want to make a web page happen. And they'd be like, okay, we're going to send over an account executive. You're going to have to get clients, li client licenses, and da da da. And I'm like, so actually, I already downloaded Apache. And I'm already serving stuff. And it's like, it was just so fast, right? So, so I always felt that, like, you know, the open standards of the internet and the open source implementations of it, they, they were hand in hand. And they grew so fast because no one else could keep up with them in the commercial world, right? Um, and that's, that's, again, a simplification, but it was, it was really pretty neat. And, and, and we were in a time in the mid-90s, right, where everything had stopped working so well, right? It was really boring, right? If you had an awesome desktop application, you would be like, this is great, and then Microsoft would kill you, or, or, you, or some, it, you'd have a really hard time shipping suddenly or something, because it was, it was you had proof. It's not like you, it's so associated with bullshit. Excuse my language, internet. You know, it, it was true. true. You, know, you had a really hard time on the desktop. Um, and, and it's funny, too, because with web browsers, you know, I'm sure you all remember, like, the long slog of IE6, right? Until, until I think it was Blake Ross and Ben Goodger, they took Mozilla, they stripped out all the crap. I mean, it wasn't crap, it was just thick, right? Um, th they got rid of the, the web designer, the mail client, the gopher client, the FTP client, I don't know if the gopher was still in there. Uh, the FTP client, all that stuff, they just got rid of it all, they added an extension system, and they said, here's just like pure gecko with basic bookmarking and this cool extension system, and that was Firefox. And, and people are like, whoa, web browsers can be fast and cool and, and not give my computer to whatever random web page I might visit? And, this is great, right? And 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 at the time, you know, people would go to, they would. Th this is a story I verified. They would go to the Steve Ballmers and, and and the higher ups at Microsoft and say, you know, we need more than ten people on IE. And he's like, why? Well, this Firefox thing is doing really well. He's like, what's their market share? And it was like one percent, two percent. They're like, he's like, come back in my office when they hit nine percent. They're like, nine percent. And he basically pulled it out of his back pocket, which is near as it, you know. And uh, he's like, yeah, once they hit 9%, I'll care again. Because until then, what's the point of wasting the money? And it's like, really? Uh, OK. So they waited. And, and you know, Firefox hit 9% you know, in, in a couple of years. It took a little while. And then they hired 1,000 people to work on the IE team. Um, and it's like, whenever we see single vendors take control of a given technology, it just stops. It stinks, you know? Uh, because it makes it very hard for independent, smaller vendors, even uh, other projects to, to take hold. And what I've seen in my career in open source is that open source projects will often say, well, wait a second, you know, why aren't we doing this? Let's do this, right? And so they, they come up with the next server software, the next bit of, of operating system that is needed to compete against these entrenched interests. Um, and, and without the OSS pressure, if you will, other vendors have to rise up, and it's actually, it's pretty rare, right? Uh, vendors kind of like their monopolies, right? So without open source fighting, y you're in a bad place. And what's funny, too, is, you know, it's not that open source is itself better or worse than a given vendor's implementation. We could talk about this for hours. We won't, mind you. Um, and in fact, y you've seen OSS projects get calcified. Right and and stop innovating and or even become insecure and then another one will pop up and they'll start fighting 
and it'll be better for all of us, all of us system administrators and users and, and the rest. And you'll even see, you know, vendors say, well, wait a second, you know, SendMail is, is great, but it's really hard to configure a SendMail CS file, right? Uh, and QMail was just starting up, and meanwhile, Outlook, and, or whatever they call their server, uh, Exchange at the time, they were like, we can really go after this market because people want a decent mail server, and they're having a hard time maintaining a secure SendMail server without RBLs and all the rest, right? So, um, so, so you see this happening, and it's actually really good for computer science, it's really good for the computer industry, and it's really good for standards when people are fighting to serve people better. And, and when you look at the standards that come under, you know, say, one vendor control, or you look at things that come under one vendor's, like, iron grip, it, it's always a grim thing. And, and there was a discussion, I don't know if it was at this IETF, um, but it was recent. I, I couldn't remember where it was from. It, it, actually, I think it was around the uh, new IEEE IPR policy, where they're talking about free and reasonable patent you know, terms and all this stuff, and it's like, and what it was was Qualcomm was, was for it, so everyone was assuming it was bad for everybody else. And it's like, well, well how'd that happen, right? Um, and so in, in organizations that aren't the IETF, where they have very controlling views of what happens with the IP that, that is created in these standards organizations, you have real problems with innovation. You have real problems moving computer science forward. So, um, so, so I, I, I like to say that an ideal situation, honestly, in my mind, is when you have multiple open source efforts along with multiple vendor efforts fighting, basically tell people out. And you actually see this in a hybrid situation. If you look at, you know, whether it's something like Docker or Nginx, where you've got this really, you know, uh, innovative, prolific, fast-moving open source project, and then you've got a company saying, well, how do we sell services or whatever around that? And so they're trying to sort of serve both models at the same time. But it's, it's, I think it's really good for the internet when that happens. I think it's really good for humans when that happens. So. Um, because standards do exist without open source. I think that they're best when they have open source implementations. And in fact, I don't think that a good standard can exist without a good open source implementation. But they certainly do all the time. If you look in the world of, of electrical interfacing, if you look in the world of telecom, construction, law, there's all these standards uh, that are out there. And they're often incredibly locked down, you know? especially in the, in the electrical engineering space. It's very hard to say, I mean, this is what kept, uh, I think it was the, uh, the 1394 connections back for years, because if you wanted to ship something that supported that standard, you would ha be paying Apple a fee every single time. And it's like, and then you had the USB standard rise up, and all you really had to do for that one to become part of that standard organization was you had to pay a one-time fee, and it was accessible even to the smallest vendors. Or frankly, you would be a Chinese vendor and you wouldn't care and you'd do it anyway, right? Um, no, I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a different approach, but it's one they allowed for. Um, and, and I mean that not in a way that's like coming down on the Chinese. I mean, I love, I don't know if you've ever been, to, how many of you have ever been to like uh, Shenzhen and the factories there? Um, it, it, it's incredibly invigorating. I mean, it, it, the air is terrible, but the, the, <laughs> the factories and the stores and those enormous like 20 per floor. Uh, malls, which are, are like 10 by 10 stores selling tablets, all running Android nowadays, mind you, but um, you know, tablets and phones and drones and, and toys, and it's just, it's amazing. As a, as a computer scientist and somebody who picks up a soldering iron once a year or, or so, it's an amazing place to visit um, and, and realize that, you know, the kind of innovation that happens there is just astonishing, but I, I don't want to digress. Um, so, so y if you really look at how standards organizations work and how standards come about, oh, do you want to say something? You're at the, you have to say your name first according yes. to the rule Olaf card. Um, just a, a, a clarifying question. Yes. When you speak about standards organizations, for some reason when I read this, I think like this question can be asked in multiple ways. Uh -huh. uh, can open standards exist without open source? Can formal standards exist without open force source? Um, <laughs> Are you going to delve into that level of detail at some point? A little bit. I mean, uh, so I talk about certain standards. Like, so for instance, if you look at, I think it's might be on the next slide. Uh, yeah, I'll just talk about it now. I can, I can skip a bullet point. I'm allowed. I'm the speaker. Uh, you can eat your ham wrap sandwich. 
Um, I know, there's no hammer out. Um, yeah, so if you look at uh, an area where this drives me crazy, Olaf, I don't know where you ended up sitting down. Um, the thing that drives me crazy about, for instance, uh, media standards and codecs, right? These are incredibly locked down, right? And yet, they're often standardized, right? And whether you call that uh, MPEG LA a standards organization or a cartel or whatever, they have standardized, you know, uh, MPEG-2, MPEG-4, you know, these standards through those organizations that don't look like IETF. They don't look like any of these things. And they also charge a huge amount of money um, uh, for access and the ability to use these standards. And so they set up the cartel model around this. And what drives you, and what should drive you crazy even more so. So for instance, when AC3 went into the ISO standard, um, ISO was like, well, you know, we can't just call this a standard and let you go and, and charge fortune for these things. So ISO came up with this, uh, frankly, pretty ridiculous license uh, around AC3. And what it said was, um, here's the reference code to implement AC3, which is a sound uh, standard, by the way, in case you don't know. And um, if you download this code from the ISO website or repository or get it on some CD or whatever, uh, and you put it into your software, and you offer the source code for it too, and you call it AC3, then you can use it as a standard implementation. And so at the time, uh, I was working at VA Linux and we were running SourceForge. And a bunch of people had done exactly that. They downloaded it, they offered it as, I think it was at the time, F uh, FFmpeg or one of those projects. And they had offered AC3 decoding. So the uh, lawyer, the general counsel from Dolby, called up my uh, general counsel at VA Linux because we were hosting the code on SourceForge and left this you know, swear word laden uh, message on her, her answering machine. She brings me into her office, she's like, first of all, who's the crazy man swearing at me? And um, he was famous for swearing at people, by the way. And then, um, are we actually in trouble here? You know, do we actually have to care what he says? Uh, and I was like, well, let's, let's take a look at the, the particular example. And they were calling it AC3, they were offering software uh, source code, and they, and they were basically implementing the ISO standards. So, you know, I called him back, and I left a message with very little swear words uh, on his message machine saying, listen, if you didn't want to release this information, you shouldn't have released it to ISO, right? And future versions, actually, I don't think they did. Um, so, yeah, you see this all the time where people will create standards, charge for them, they will standardize them, but also run seek alongside them. Um, and I, I think that that's uh, obviously successful. Right, and I, I'd love to tell you that that didn't exist and didn't happen. And then there are not open source implementations because I can tell you the ISO standard reference license is not compatible with open source licenses. But most people don't care because they, they're going to be compliant with that license within the milieu of licenses that they support. So, um, and, and I like to track it back to so AT and T had that monopoly for years. You couldn't plug anything into the phone line unless it was that Bakelite, you know, phone from from AT and T. And they were forced to allow other people to build phones and to build phone services that could talk to their network. <coughs> and I think it was the late 70s. Uh, you, some of you probably remember this way better than I do. Uh, not, I'm not saying you're old, just for the record. But, um, but it was, uh, I think it was in the late 70s that happened. And then you saw this like flourishing of, of, of innovation, right? You saw really cool phones. But more importantly, you remember modems, right? Do you remember the modems that you had to socket the stupid, you know, receiver pair into, uh, because you couldn't plug it in, right? They couldn't sell a device that you could plug in. And then you could, right? And suddenly, you know, Hayes popped up and started shipping 300 bits per second. Uh, and it was great, right? And, and, and frankly, you know, we may not be here if it wasn't for that early decision, right? So, so yeah, so I think that's, that's a bad thing. And so the question then becomes, um, do we need conflict to flourish? in open standards, right? Does there have to be multiple open source, multiple vendors fighting uh, for us to ship standards that people are gonna actually flip and use, right? And I, I would say yes. And, and, and someone, I, I think it might have been Jim, you mentioned this in, in the email you sent me, and, and I glommed onto this one sentence where it was like, do we need, um, he's like, is it really an open standard if it's just one open source implementation that everyone is using? And, and what I've seen when this happens is people say, well, that's the standard. And if you look at what WG, uh, the What Working Group, which does the HTML5 standard that's adopted by the W3C, um, it, it's very interesting to watch Ian Hickson. I know, this is a very 
thing. You should get it. You have to go to the mic. You have to say your name. Here, say your name. Um, Jim Geddes, uh, Google. In the last uh, 48 hours, a second implementation has appeared, courtesy of Marcus, uh, for that uh, protocol, uh, the Babel, uh, Babel routing protocol. So there's two, yay. So we have a war. Um, but <laughs> but so, so if you look at how some of these great standards show up, it, are they really just transcription of some market winner? And, and that's a very interesting question. I talk about that in a, in a little bit. So let's, let's hop over to where phones were. Um, I think I mentioned this in my last longer talk at IETF, so I don't, I'm, I'm going to blow through this pretty fast. Um, but there was a time when Symbian phones were 90% of what we would call the smartphone world. And there was way fewer smartphones back then than there are now, of course. Um, and, and the browsers, and I'm going to use that word <laughs> really loosely, uh, that were on phones back then, you, you would literally have to buy placement if you wanted your website to be on a phone. And that's terrible. Um, and, and, and the iPhone was coming, Android was too. Um, they were both being sort of developed at about the same time. And people don't always believe me when I say that, but it's true. Um, and, and it was in response to basically nobody wanted a single vendor to control anything unless it was themselves, right? Um, and so they saw what was going on, and, and Nokia, um, you know, they really, they owned the market. Um, and, and they were like, well, what, what happens if we want to be in that market? What happens if we want to ship a web page to a phone? You know, yeah, Treo users can reach it. Uh, great. Um, and that's neat. And they had this really cool sort of ecosystem, but it was very small um, because they had trouble with distribution. Um, so anyways, um, the world that was happening, so if you, again, if you went to these Shenzhen malls back in 2005, 2006, uh, the iPhone had just come out, and you go up to them and you say, hey, do you guys have iPhones? And uh, I really should have brought my, my iPhone that I bought back then. Uh, it was pink, it was a flip phone, and it had an Apple on the back of it, like a sticker. Um, and, and what it was, was they were taking Windows CE, they wouldn't pay for Windows Mobile, because Windows Mobile costs $3 more per copy than Windows CE. So they'd take Windows CE, which they would sometimes pay for, sometimes not, but it was like a buck or two bucks per phone, right? And they, would, they had their own dialers that they made, uh, and they would just slap them on there. And then they, they had a skin, and then they put an apple on the bottom of it. Um, and, and so you know, they, they had a hard time. Obviously, they couldn't adopt Apple software, um, these different you know, handset manufacturers. And, and so when, when iPhone came out, they came to us, and they were like, OK, so we, we liked your pitch for Android before, but we really like it now. Um, so what do you got, right? And so, when we were thinking about Android, we knew we had to compete not just with the existential threat that Apple posed to all of these companies, but we also had to compete with cheaper you know, Windows implementations on top of Windows CE and the rest, because they just wanted to ship something that would make phone calls. Um, so we wanted to make Android open source from the start, and so if you look at what we open sourced back then and what we continue to open source, it's basically like you have this Linux kernel, and then you've got a whole pile of Apache code which is permissibly licensed, uh, and also has a patent grant attached. Um, and, and then you had the Google-specific services on top of that. And, and the point was, from the very beginning, it was like, listen, here's your, y we're getting you started here, right? Uh, we can all center on the same sets of drivers, the same sets of interfaces, and we can ship something that's open source. And the reason we did the open source was it's the right way to share software, frankly. And also, the reason we did Ap Apache, it, it was multi Personally, I, I really prefer Apache, so when, when we were talking about how to do this, I was like, we should use Apache. Um, but also, we need something that carriers, frankly, would understand and be able to comply with by default. So we wrote a lot of tooling so that when you build Android, it's actually hard to build something that isn't in compliance with the Apache license. And then we tried to train them on the use of the GPL kernel and tried to make sure that those kernels were available, for at least for the phones that we personally shipped at Google. Um, and, and that was really hard. Um, carriers, handset manufacturers, they're actually really bad at open source compliance. And, and, and it's not a malicious thing. Um, it's really just, it's hard for them. You know, they want to ship a phone every X days. They want to, how do we, where do we mirror this stuff? You know, so these co questions come up. And then the documentation requirements are very hard. So we tried to create a phone that they could comply with very easily. And we were mostly successful. So that was good. Um, yeah, let me continue here. So browsers, um, 
I mentioned the 9% story, that's all cool. Um, and, and Firefox grew for, I want to say they hit 12, 13% before we started seeing IE actually start being any good again. Um, and, and we were, you know, at Google, we were giving a lot of patches into Firefox at the time. And what we wanted is we wanted JavaScript performance to improve. We wanted sandboxing on a per tab basis. Um, we wanted better security. And we were having a harder and harder time seeing our patches accepted. Because they were like, whoa, 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 this sandboxing thing you want to do, it's, we're going to have to change everything for that to work. And we're like, yes. But you need it. You know? um, anyone who's ever had a tab take out their entire browser knows that you needed it. Um, and it was hard for them to prioritize. So we're like, okay, so we did Chrome. And, and we released Chrome under a BSD license. And what we did is uh, we picked that, uh, both because we, we were basing it largely on the KHTML and, uh, and, and that work, which actually came out of the Conqueror browser, was used by Safari, was worked on by Apple, um, and released as BSD. And then we started releasing under BSD as well. So, and our, our goal was that the, any browser, any browser could adopt our changes and around sandboxing the rest because we thought it was really important for keeping the internet a sort of a safe place to surf. Um, and we were kind of successful at that. Chrome, Chrome was very successful as a browser, but I would say we were only moderately successful at getting other people to adopt what we were doing. A, a lot of people saw the light on JavaScript performance, which was great, great for everyone who was using a browser. You saw better JavaScript performance from from Apple, Microsoft, Mozilla. And, and so I'd like to claim some bit of that uh, for, for our, our, our Chrome folks. Um, but we still don't have great sandboxes across browsers. And that's, that's a probably the biggest existential danger to the internet. Uh, if there are places that can break through to your machine through your browser, it's bad for internet sites. It's bad for internet surfing. And it drives more people into the apps uh, that have become so very popular uh, on phones and stuff. Um, so yeah, so let me keep going. Uh, so we get to the meat of the, of the thing. Um, and my problem is, uh, I'd love to tell you that I really understand the position of Open Daylight versus other SDN things. Um, we started funding SDN work, uh, well, let me take a step back. Back in 2007, 2008, Broadcom Fabric switches were not supported by Linux, period. End of story. And we really needed it because we were looking at, frankly, extremely costly uh, high density switch costs at Google. And so we wanted to deploy uh, switches that had many thousands of ports uh, and were very fast. But to do so with commercial equipment, uh, I'm not going to say it would bankrupt us because we, we were doing okay, but um, it was going to be extremely costly. I, I, on the orders of many, 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 practically $1,000 a port, but many hundreds of dollars per port. And, and it it just was untenable. So we wanted to have our own switch fabric. So as early as 2006, we started working on this kind of thing. Um, and then Broadcom Fabric support, you know, if we could just get that, that would be great. So we funded a lot of work. Dovetailed well into sort of the, the SDN future, right? Um, and, and so a lot of the work that we did there and that we did there uh, is now being standardized. Um, and what does that mean, right? So is this a real thing? So because I, I'm, I, there, there's a number of people from Cisco and Juniper here, I'm sure. And I don't want to alienate you from the pulpit here. Um, but a lot of people see Open Daylight as basically uh, those organizations being like Qualcomm in that earlier example. Therefore, should we be worried, you know? Um, are, are they trying to squash this really interesting new technology, or are they trying to help it? Um, uh, is it rent-seeking? Is it the JCP? Or is it something that's truly open? So I think that's something that Cisco and, and, and Juniper probably need to address um, if they want people to s sort of sign on. And, and the thing is, the open source world, there's a cable here that I keep stepping on. I'm going to walk this way. Um, <laughs> what's that? I was trying to wake you up, yes because my voice will make you sleep. Um, sorry about that AV person. I don't mean to screw up the mic here. Um, don't drop the mic, by the way. People are like, and then I dropped the mic. It's actually bad for the mic, just for the record. Um, <laughs> anyway, so 
open daylight, right? So, because if you, if you look at uh, companies like Fastly, are any Fastly people here at IETF? I, I don't know if that's true. But I'm, I'm sure there are people who use Fastly here. Um, you know, Fastly is basically, it's a bunch of Linux boxes, a bunch of, a bunch of white box Linux boxes that they've programmed to do this sort of work. And, and, and they're very big fans of being able to just use these open implementations. Um, and it would be great if they weren't, you know, rent seeked against for doing that. Um, yeah. So, so I think the IETF really has a role in making sure that SDN persists as something that we can all take advantage of and, and help develop and move forward. So keep it up, IETF. Okay, so the other thing I want to talk about, and the thing that's really been bugging me over the last like three or four years that I mentioned earlier in the talk, um, is that I, I, I always see open source as this beautiful palace on a hill, right? I, it's like, it's such a special thing for me, uh, the licenses, the people who work on the software that's released under these licenses. Um, and unfortunately, um, over the last, really over the last three or four years, you've started seeing people trying to trick people. They're like, oh no, we're open source. And you're like, are you? Are you really? And, and I am not the kind of person who says that you can't make money with open source. I'm not that person at all. Anyone who knows me and, and my, 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 my thing for expensive shoes knows I like making, making money, okay? Um, but uh, I always, and, and I'm employed to make sure that through the adoption of open source and through the release of open source, we're not um, tricking or trapping people. So, so this is my trips, tracks, and trolls. Um, so first of all, in the tricks thing, there's people who approach open source and say, yeah, we're open source, we're, uh, I came up with something, it, it's open source. And you see this actually a lot in a non-malicious way, in, in a benign way. People who have the best of intentions but just don't have the education. So for instance, if you go to GitHub today, how many of you have downloaded something from GitHub and, and installed it on a machine? Ever. So 70% of the code on GitHub has no open source licenses, copyright the author, and you shouldn't have done that. So why is that? But if you email them and say, hey, we really want to use this piece of code, and, you, and they say, well, yeah, it's open source. It's on GitHub. You say, hold on a second. There's no open source license on this thing. And they're like, oh, well, can you give me a pull request? And it's like, sure. <laughs> you know, I can give you a license. Uh, what do you, which one do you want? And so honestly, this happens probably about once a week where I'm emailing somebody saying, hey, it's not really open source. Did you mean it to be? And nine times out of 10, they say, yes, I meant it to be. I don't know which one to use, though. And then you ask them, well, what's your thing? Do you want people to reshare? Do you want people to say, I got it from you? What's your goal, right? And they go, oh, I don't care what they do with it. I just, I'd love for them to say that they got it from me. I'm like, oh, well, then you probably want to patch your BSD. And if they're a JavaScript person, I say MIT or BSD. So, so most of the time when people trick you, it's because they don't know what they're doing. Sometimes, though, um, they know exactly what they're doing. They say, no, 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 I put it up on GitHub because I just want to develop there. I don't want anyone using this code. This is my, no. And it's like, okay, I totally respect your desires. These other people who forked your code, whatever, but we're cool. <laughs> no, seriously, because the GitHub terms of service are hilarious. They basically say, um, by putting your code up here, you're allowing people to fork this code. Uh, however, you are not conferring copyright with that fork. Okay, yeah. Uh, you have to say your name first. My name is Read Stuart Cheshire. Okay, Stuart. If this is an issue you're dealing with on a regular basis, that seems like it would be a good suggestion back to the maintainers of GitHub that when you make a new project, one yep. of the questions should be, what license do you want for this? So they do have a license picker, and they have this chooseyourlicense.org thing that they put together. And they're actually, they don't want to be too heavy-handed because they want everyone to develop on GitHub, not just open source developers. So, so they've done some things, and actually they used to be 85% of the code was not licensed, and then they put in the license chooser and it went to 70%. So that was a move forward, right? Uh, say your first name. Marco Stenberg. Uh, I actually want to point out that when you create a new repository, it actually explicitly asks you about what sort of license yeah, do see, you want to really use good for now. it. But yeah. of course the problem is that for a typical person who, who actually is educated enough to choose a license, not me at least, and I have a bunch of GitHub repositories. So, so you're going to go home and you're going to pick a license, right? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, so th this sort of stuff happens all the time. Uh, and, and part of our training at Google is we say, listen, you want to use this code, that's great, we're here to help you. Sometimes you won't be able to, though. Um, other times, people choose Creative Commons licenses. First of all, if you read the Creative Commons fact, they say, this is not for software. But whatever. And then they pick the uh, non-commercial, no modification, uh, you know, by, uh, you know, attribution 
version of the license. And it's like, really? That's not, you're not actually sharing software then. You know, you're, you're doing something, but, um, and people always think that non-commercial means something that's not. Well, well non-commercial, well, we're not gonna make any money from this code. And it's like, well, we're a commercial organization. And in fact, if you look at a lot of universities and the way they're funded, and their labs, and the way the intellectual property in the labs gets, gets sold, and it's their commercial function too. So you have this situation where people use licenses that are completely inappropriate if they actually want to open source something. So sometimes they actually don't want to open source it. And, and you should respect that. But you know, you can learn from the code, but maybe you can't use it. Um, oftentimes, you, there's a, a new license called the WTFPL, which I'll highlight in the next slide and I'll talk about. But people create new licenses, uh, and I'll tell you why that can be a bad thing. And then other times, they'll, they'll do this thing where they'll mix licenses together. So jQuery is under a very permissive license. I think it's BSD or MIT. I don't remember which. Um, or some very, very popular jQuery plugins are under uh, the, the extremely viral AGPL license, which actually sh re reaches across network as it's... So uh, the GPL, if I give it to Jim, and Jim wasn't working at Google or whatever, and I said, here's some software, Jim, and it's GPL, you can say, well, I would like to see the GPL code. And I would have to give it to Jim, and I would want to give it to Jim, because I made that choice. The AGPL is a little different. If Jim visits a web page, and it has some AGPL content, now he's within his right. Can I have the code for all this stuff on the web page? Oh, and this is going over the network, and you guys have your own network switches. Can I see that code? Oh, and this is hitting these servers, and can we see that code? Because it, it, the virality is through the, the network port. Um, so obviously, we don't use this at Google, but sometimes people will slip in because um, they just, by default, use AGPL or GPL or whatever. Um, and, and, and that can be very tricky for people. But it might be a trick. It might be just benign neglect. Or uh, that's what they wanted, right? So you have to assume people know what they're doing when they pick these licenses. Um, other times, people say, oh, we're using FFmpeg, but it's LGPL, so it's totally okay to ship it this way. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's GPL. And they're like, no, 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 see, here's the license. It's LGPL. I was like, did you use this compile flag? <laughs> they're like, yeah, how did you know? And I'm like, because you're using FFmpeg. Everyone uses that compile flag in FFmpeg. And they're like, oh, well, what does that do? And I'm like, it makes it GPL. <laughs> because it basically brings with it like MPEG uh, 4 and 2 compatibility, which everyone needs from FFmpeg, so everyone compiles it that way, I believe. And um, yeah, so, so sometimes things become a different license because of how they're configured. And people don't know how to deal with this. They don't, they don't understand. And then they end up breaking a license, right, which is really bad because it's the wrong thing to do. Um, and then other times you have people who either embrace or completely reject the, or later versions language in, in the GPL and the LGPL because they either want to reinforce patent sharing and replaceability or they want to reject it, right? And so there's all these things that you have to kind of kind of look into and understand if you want to ship a product. Um, and then there's this real question that comes up. I swear to God, this is like, I could be employed for the rest of my life on this sentence alone. All of you can. This is a great scam for jobs. Um, when is a plugin not a plugin? When is something calling a system interface? When is something calling an executable? When is someone calling a dynamic library versus a static library connection? When is somebody just like, uh, you know, sending through the network some command that executes a command that creates a plugin? I mean, there's all these questions that come because a lot of these licenses, the obligations come from linking, right? And, and linking is a, is a very fluidly defined thing, right? Um, you know, it's like if you're calling a Lua script in a game that then calls this thing, what happens? And, and the thing is, there's actually very few people who want to reach beyond, beyond the boundaries of their software, right, with their licensing regime. And the rest is just too hard to police and, and the rest. But it is, uh, it is a very interesting problem because this is also where, where charlatans and scammers and, and malicious people find solace. They say, no, 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 I'm not using the GPL that way. I, I called it via a system interface. You know, so it, that's like saying, if I run GCC, Windows is now open source. And it's like, you know, it's not really what it says. You know, uh, and, and people say things like this all the time to, to hide from their obligations. Whereas they, they really should have just gone with a BSD thing in the first place. Um, anyways, here's the text of the... the we're all adults here. Um, the, w, the F in WTF, PL means is what the fuck public license. So do what the fuck you want public license. 
This is a very simple document. You're like, wow, this person has embraced sharing it away we have never seen before. That's amazing. And to his credit, Sam just wanted to share some code. He's like, here you go, take it. The problem is, in America, in WIPO signatory countries, you know that, that block of capital letters in every license? Um, so copyright is actually a set of established enumerated rights. For software, there's seven of them. Soon there'll be eight, but right now there's seven of them. And, and basically it's the, the warranty of fitness, all of these things, right? So without that, you're vulnerable. And let me tell you what you're vulnerable to. So if I say to Jim, Jim, um, I want to use X11 in my nuclear reactor. Is it the best implementation of a windowing system? And you go, sure, it'll work great for you in your nuclear reactor. Now, you think I'm talking about nuclear reactors. I'm not, right? He just said it was, it was the right implementation for me to use. And if for some reason it doesn't work for me, uh, I can sue Jim. Unless he has a no express warranty for fitness, right? Um, if, it, you know, there's all kinds of things in there. So you should read that block of text sometime. But this is missing that. So what this means is that if you ship something under the WTFPL, you can be sued. People are sued all the time for this. And they lose if they don't have that kind of language instantiated in a contract with you. So you shipping WTFPL is bad for you personally. And so I don't let any Googlers release under this license. But we could use stuff, right? Because who cares if they're vulnerable, right? There's a moral question. But who cares if they're vulnerable if we use their software? But the problem is, if you look at how copyright actually works, the problem with do what the fuck you want is it's not clear if, if it's I get to do what the fuck I want or what the fuck Jim wanted by releasing it, right? So, so we have this problem that I get to, you just do what the fuck you want to. So who's you, who's what, and fuck? So it's like, <laughs> it turns out, sadly, these are not legal terms, <laughs> right? So, so you can clarify it, and what happens is, is people say, well, we can just, we'll put in a clarifying statement. I'm like, you're just writing a software license then, okay? And the problem is people say, well, I'm just going to release things under the public domain, but I can tell you something. We're in France, not right now. We're in Dallas, which I guess is very not French. And, um, <laughs> but if you're in France and you release something under the public, what's your name? Your, what's your name? Uh, Timo. So you're probably actually from like Finland, right? Or Norway? Yeah. Um, so, but you're in French to France today, okay? So Timo sells me a piece of software, uh, and, uh, or actually a sculpture. You're an artist. So he sells me a piece of sculpture, and it's a beautiful sculpture of something that's very important to his people in France. And, uh, and then I sell it to Jim for 10 times as much, right? Because I want to make money. Um, so you sold it to me for $1,000. I sold it to him for 10000 You go, hey, wait a second. Where's my, I, I, that's nine, that, where? <sighs> Under the World Natural Property Organization in France, your moral rights attach. So you can come to me and say, where's, where's my cut? And I have to give you some money from that sale. Right? You can articulate those moral rights. Similarly, suppose Jim is a neo-Nazi. <laughs> He's not. <laughs> but suppose he is. You can come to me and say, I don't want, no, you can't sell my beautiful sculpture of freedom to a neo-Nazi. And you could stop the sale. And you know what? If you had released it under the WTFPL, you can still stop the sale. If you release it under the public domain, you can still stop the sale. So moral rights still attach, right? So there's all these questions that come up by this. And in fact, with open source software licenses, they don't address moral rights at all. But they've been around long enough that the courts have come to understand that you can actually license your software and moral rights stop attaching and they can be reproduced and all the rest. So open source can persist in France. Um, so yeah, so the problem with these licenses is they're well-intentioned, despite the potty mouth aspect, they're very well-intentioned. But we don't, unfortunately, we don't live in a world where these intentions can be articulated in this way. So just use a BSD license for Cripe's sake. Or an MIT license, an MIT license if you're East Coast. <laughs> <laughs> but some of us are Westsiders. <laughs> Again, that was a rap joke that nobody got. Um, so. <laughs> so, uh, an another trap you've been How are we doing on time? What time is it? Does anyone have? It's 10 till, so I have 10 minutes. I can be a little over because the next one starts at, at 1 o'clock, right? 
Okay, I'm gonna go fast. So CLAs, you'll be asked to sign a contributor license agreement if you give code, ooh, I'm gonna destroy the whole place. Um, if you try to give code to the Free Software Foundation, the Apache Foundation, Ubuntu, uh, Google, any Google projects, you'll be asked to sign a contributor license agreement. We base ours exactly on the Apache Foundation one. So, that's good. Free Software Foundation, you can kind of trust the FSF to do what they're gonna say, but theirs says you're giving them an exclusive copyright, right? Ours say you're giving us a non-exclusive, so you can keep doing whatever you want with your code, and we're going to release it as open source software. Right? It basically says you have the power to give us that code. But CLAs, some of them are really, really grabby, and I would never recommend signing a CLA unless it looked exactly like the Apache one, like ours does. Okay? Because for the most part, most CLAs are good because they're based on the Apache license, or they're bad. And they're, they say things like, and any patent you've ever filed becomes ours by the way. Uh, and anything you might do that's kind of related to this becomes ours, by the way. And there's like these little trap clauses, so be very careful. So, and, and these are actually presented to people at hackathons. So basically, not all of them, but probably about 20% of the hackathons out there that you might take part in, you're quitting your job by signing on to them, right? Because you're giving up all of your rights, past, present, future, to the hackathon organizer. So don't do that. Um, license add-ons, we see patent clauses. A as early as 1998, we saw people trying to basically say, Here's a, a real-time Linux patch. Victor Udiakin famously did this. But if you use it, you're going to be paying me a patent fee. And so they never adopted it. They adopted other real-time Linux things. But he still tried to sue based on it. It was really terrible. Um, Crockfordisms, which we'll go quickly into since we're running out of time. Um, they say the software will be used for good and not evil. Now, I'd like to think that Google is not an evil place. Um, but my flavor of good and evil is certainly different than what Doug might say. And so we got a we got a release, we don't have to have this sentence in our versions of JSMIN. Same thing with IBM. So he goes around saying they can be evil. Um, but the problem with these is that a lot of people used to have add-ons to open source licenses that said not to be used by this group, that group, you know, Jewish people, non-Jewish people, abortion clinics, nuclear power plants, militaries. And so we, we said that that was not okay in the open source world. But it, it sneaks back in, and it's been sneaking back in lately more often, where people try to control who can use the software based on their personal ethics and morals. And sometimes those are not always aligned with humanity. Um, finally, and I don't want to waste any more of your time. I know you have to get to the working groups. It's really important that you do that work. So um, there's a lot of terms of services that are terrible and patent clauses that are terrible. So for the WebM codex uh, that we released from Google, we added a patent clause that said, here, any patents we have here, we're letting you have license to. If you sue us around these codex, you don't have license to them anymore. We'll use them in our defense. So it's, it's literally very much like the Apache license patent grant. But there have been others lately that have come out that look like this. And they say, um, if, if you should sue them, whether or not it's related to the software, you lose rights. It's like, well, that's a little extreme, but okay. And it says, also, if you should, through any lawsuit, assertion, or other action. So let me ask you something. Do you think that every patent ever filed is valid? Just raise your, say, hmm, if you think that every patent <laughs> uh, is valid. Anyone? Okay, so every single one of you has now violated this, this clause. Every single one of you. And they can withdraw any sort of patent rights and then they can use it to control you. So this is out there right now. They're changing it, we've been talking with them, that's why I put X's instead of the company's name because they, they really want it to be better. But this was overreaching, right? And this sort of thing happens and you have to be careful. Um, and sadly, you see a lot of consortiums that are open standards organizations in name only. You see this in the JCP, you see this in some subsets of Oasis. Be careful, the presence of the word open does not help you, right? And we already talked about open daylight and I really think that Cisco should try very hard to be truly open. And I think that they, they can be, so I'm optimistic. Um, and now I'll just wrap in saying, running code isn't all there is to it. It's code that people have to be able to use without fear of rent seeking. And, and, and that way, the code can be used everywhere on the internet, everywhere on Earth. And that's, that's the great thing about the IETF. So just do a great job, that's all I would say. And, and, and I'll just leave the rest because I've already gone over time. Um, thank you, and I hope you had a good lunch. So. Is there a time for questions?
Are there any questions allowed? I mean, we've got four minutes. If the next presenter wants to come up and plug in, uh, I'll take questions until the next one starts. Oh, but actually, I don't want to be rude, <laughs> but please. Yeah, I wanted to hear, um, I'm Rajan, by the way.